Hello, Comic-Con, make some noise again! All right, all right. I cannot believe we are back here at SDCC. What a great way to start day one. I got a lot of questions, so we're just gonna dive right in. Um, this first question is for everybody, but we're gonna start with Jennifer, because uh, you are right here. <laughs> So obviously this is the first time we're back at San Diego Comic-Con since 2019, if you can believe that. It feels obviously great to be back in full force with you all. Now these past few years have been rough on everyone and I wanna tune into how everyone's workflow has changed. Uh, Jennifer, I'd love to start with you to talk about the production process changed for you while working on the Paramount Plus series behind the music. Thanks, Chris. I'm a little short. I feel like I need a booster seat. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway um, as we know, production's changed, especially with COVID. Uh, it's been interesting. You have to be creative, working with different departments. For Behind the Music, we work with artists, right? So we're telling their stories and really diving in. So the creative process, usually you're all together between your producers, your story producers, your editors, as well as the artists. We have to go online. And also when we're shooting, it's a much smaller pool that, of people that can be there. So a lot of the, it, to pull out the different creative process and to really get to the story and to be able to tell the, these beautiful stories of these artists, you have to be creative because there's a lot of roadblocks having to do with making sure everyone stays safe as well as timelines keep getting pushed up because everyone knows we need more content, we need more content. But unfortunately, schedules have not changed. Uh, the content, the content the rush, I, ooh, I get it. All right, so this next question is for Pete with the coolest glasses in the room, might I add? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, applause for the glasses. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about the flight attendant. Episode five from the second session is uh, such a pivotal episode for Kaylee Kuoko's character. Can you talk about how you visually approach the episode and the importance of camera angles to tell the story? Yeah, also, yeah. you may be entering a spoiler zone here, just so you all know. <laughs> oh yeah, too, sorry. Um, so, uh, well, thank, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I think that it was, uh, it was a very interesting episode because it was based on many of the things that we thought we knew as an audience, uh, being revealed to be lies or, uh, untruths. And so, um, as, well, I, I can't talk around it. So, <laughs> so once we find out that she's actually fallen off the wagon, and she's been lying about having been sober for a year. Um, the script actually said, you know, from this point forward, it's all about, uh, you know, abrupt jump cuts and hard angles and all this stuff. And so for me, I was like, I've never had that kind of liberty thrown at me to mm -hmm. say, go ahead and, and do what you love to do with the camera. Um, and so it was finding a way to balance that with um, the DNA of the show, not making it into a different show and also um, kind of pushing, you know, trying to find myself in the story and interpret it with my own directorial eye. And um, because of that, if you watch season two, it's very heavy on motion control because there are up to five different Cassie characters that, that are uh, used in the this, in this, in this season. And so what uh, I chose to do was kind of step away from motion control simplify it and try and do as many of the doubling and tripling scenes in camera and just use a double and kind of creative, you know, over the shoulders with the right hair and the right posture because each of the different characters had a different kind of, you know, uh, embodiment um, and, you know, leave room for going for broke. So we used a lot of, um, we use a tri-axis head for the super technical folks in here, which is what allows you to kind of let the camera do a, a 360 revolution like that and that was kind of the way that uh, I used that to communicate the fall off the wagon and, and over the course of the episode it's kind of introduced and then it finally has a handshake between the mind palace and the flashback that reveals what's real um, so it was it was very fun and uh, you know there was a lot of thinking to do I never had to think about how I would shoot something as much as, as I did on that episode um, which was you know a, an opportunity and a challenge Intricate stuff, intricate cool. stuff. Um, on the same kind of director vibe, let's talk to you, Wendy. What are the biggest differences in your approach when working on shows like the sci-fi comedy drama Made for Love versus the superhero comic book driven action drama of a show like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here. I feel very cool. <laughs> my son thinks I'm cool. That's all that matters. You are very cool. You are very cool in my eyes and everyone else's eyes here. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I married to, I married a big nerd, and so I became like a huge e comic book fan. And I think when you're doing things for DC and Marvel, there's like a canon that you really have to understand and know, and it's kind of your responsibility to, um, to be, you know, be familiar with each character, the stories, and, and Marvel especially has an incredible, um, a number of young female employees that are the biggest nerds of all time. And it's just so cool because on set, you have these young women, mostly, that are just, they know everything. And they're kind of seeing these shows through. So I think that you're stepping into this moving train of something that the fans know, and they've known for decades, you know, and it's as opposed to Made for Love, which is Similarly, uh, we had a, the finale, the two last episodes, so I got to use a lot of the action that I used with um, any of the Marvel stuff that I've done. Um, but it's quirky and odd, and there aren't those rules, and it's a, a show that the actors really crafted and created the characters with the creator. And Kristen Milioti, who's a genius, and Ray Romano and Billy Rasmus, and you know, they're just like such incredible um, that were actors that were given the freedom to create uh, this zaniness, and there were no rules. And yes, they're fans of this book, which is great, but it's a very different thing. But the skills of the filmmaking overlapped, which was super fun. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow. I'm trying really hard not to geek out right now, but these people are really cool. <laughs> Sorry, let me go back to my script here. Yes, okay, our next question is for James. James, during your time composing the Total Drama series, how did you approach scoring the various pop culture references throughout the show? Hi, everybody. Um, so first of all, this is not only my first Comic-Con panel, this is my first Comic-Con at, like, at all. Hey! So this is awesome. I've been waiting years to come here. So. And uh, thanks for coming out today to listen to us talk about our work. I really appreciate it. I think we all really appreciate it. Um, so with Total Drama, that's like one of my favorite shows to work on specifically because of the pop culture references and stuff. I knew it was a great show to work on. From the first episode, one of the characters was wearing like an X-Wing fighter pilot uh, outfit. And I was like, this is, this is perfect. I was born for this. Uh, so I basically was a complete nerd when I was young and watched a lot of film and television and took mental notes and didn't realize I was studying for this job, this career, uh, until I started working on these shows. And there's all these callbacks to various things, Star Wars, The Matrix, Jaws, things like that. Uh, so basically, the, the two things that we have to watch out for, I also want to give a shout out to my co-writers, my business partners, Brian Pickett and Graham Cornies. Uh, the three of us uh, compose all the music together. Um, so the first thing we look at is uh, uh, there's two things that we have to be aware of. First of all, there's a legal, uh, a legal situation. Like, I can't just put a Star Wars theme in there, right? Like, <laughs> that's not going to work. Uh, the second thing we have to think about is the, is the amount of time. Usually, uh, these little bits are five seconds, ten seconds. And we have to distill the idea of Star Wars or Indiana Jones or whatever down into that five second little thing. So in season one, there was a, a shark attack situation happening. Of course, we're going to do Jaws. So what I, I would ask myself, you know, what, is, what are the elements that when I hear them, I think, oh, that's Jaws. Well, there's two notes. So that's easy. <laughs> There's bassoons, low strings, uh, maybe a little French horn thing, right? Um, so what I would do is just, in that situation, I think I just took the two notes and like reversed them or like changed them around and had some low instruments, Jaws, done. Um, my favorite one that I did though on the show was, uh, was an Indiana Jones uh, type piece. And I rarely get the chance to do this because it was actually like 30 seconds long where the, the guy's like swinging across a thing with a whip and everything. And I just took the Indiana Jones theme and just like reversed it. Dun, 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 dun. And like, I, I thought I was a genius. I'm, I'm a creative genius. This is, nobody's gonna even think of this. Um, so, uh, I, and I also think there was like a matrix, a couple matrix things. 
uh, in the in the first season. Um, so, anyways, that's uh, that's sort of our approach to how we would do uh, the pop culture references without getting sued and still communicating to everybody that you know this is supposed to be the Matrix or Indiana Jones or whatever. So, yeah. Very nice, very nice. Jason, I apologize. We were going down the row so nicely, and then I, it skipped over you. It, the script told me to do it. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring it back to you, because you are doing some amazing things in the NFT space. Um, Jason, as an author, you get the opportunity to work with words to bring stories to life. What was your creative process like for writing your novel, Lost Children of Andromeda, and how are you try tying in NFTs into it? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So nice to be here with all of you. Um, thank you, Impact24. Uh, okay, so the process of creating my novel, writing my, my writing this series was actually a lifetime. It's been about 28 years since I first started it. And um, I published 2050Z Time and Salvation last July. And shortly after that, I had this idea to somehow enhance the reading experience using digital assets in the blockchain. Um, I thought it was very fun, the process of writing and also the process of discovery, and I wanted to have the readers also be able to experience that by collecting different artifacts from the world as they move through the chapters of the story. Um, so I would say, like, I don't love using the word NFTs because it's one of those words that you don't use. Like, you know, it's like slanderous or it's, like, it's, like, it's, it's, it's a little I bit of a curse word, kind of. This is, this um, is my formal <laughs> apology for using that <laughs> no, word. it's totally fine. <laughs> um, but I, I prefer to use the term digital assets because that's what we're creating. And they're connected to a physical world, which is the world that we've built, which is Lost Children of Andromeda. So um, that's how we play in the space, um, just trying to gamify the reading experience. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, so now, Ryan, you are the composer of several Star Wars series like Galaxy of Adventures and Forces of Destiny. May you give us some insight into uh, your scoring process for such an iconic franchise and how do you make the score different while still making it sound like it's part of the Star Wars universe? Hey, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here at Comic-Con this year. Thank you to Impact24 also for inviting me. Um, and uh, I have absolutely loved scoring for Star Wars and Lucasfilm. It's been a composing dream. It's, it's actually not even been a dream because I never even thought I'd be able to have that job. Um, but uh, when it, it, it came, each of those series have different musical uh, requirements and directives that come from Lucasfilm. So Forces of Destiny was the first one that I did. And that one... They, they asked me to use John Williams' themes, um, and, but they're very specific about how the themes can be used. So, um, you know, they're such iconic themes. When we hear them, they sound like Star Wars, so um, it can almost be a, a cheat, you know, to just, like, play one of those themes, and it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Star Wars. <laughs> so um, uh, I would receive direction that, that, you know, it needs to be judicious about how the themes are used to make sure they're being used in the right times the right um, ways um, and so that was forces of destiny and i also uh, composed my own themes and and worked my music with with john williams themes which was became a dream come true i never thought that that would ever happen um, the next series i did for them was galaxy of adventures and that one was a different directive so in that one it was a combination where i would use actual recordings from the like the 1977 recordings and actual Star Wars recordings and then I would also write my own music and bridge them together which was a challenge in and of itself which is how to make a new you know recording today sound like a recording from uh, you know many decades ago and and be able to seamlessly go between them so that hopefully it doesn't sound like it's cutting between two different things uh, and then the other uh, Galaxy Adventures series I did, which is called Galaxy Adventures Fun Facts, totally different directive there. So in that one, Lucasfilm didn't want to even be orchestral. So that was a total departure where I did everything with synths to sound like synths, you know, a very contemporary score um, and, uh, and, and no uh, Williams themes in that at all. So it's been amazing. Like every time I've gotten a chance, I think I've done it o over 100 episodes for Star Wars now. Every series is a whole different 
um, you know, world, uh, you know, sandbox to play in. This is crazy stuff, you guys. <laughs> Jeez. Um, okay, so this next question is for everybody, but again, um, we're gonna start with Jennifer here. Um, as it's completely evident with all of the exciting and cool work Jason is doing, storytelling is not just limited to writing books, film, and TV. There's so much more we can do to tell our stories and share them with the world. Jennifer, I've heard you're working on a podcast. Do you want to spill the details? Sure, but I like to call it a radio play. I'm sorry, a radio, radio play. Radio play, not a podcast. So uh, just like with books and film and TV, audio is an amazing storytelling mechanism. So back in the 50s, as families got together and put on the radio to listen to entire plays, spoiler alert for some of you younger people, uh, America thought War of the Worlds was real and it was happening and there was a panic. So audio <laughs> storytelling definitely has you know, it's rooted not only in American roots, but also internationally, just how we tell stories throughout the world. It's through the audio, through storytelling. So we decided to do a podcast. Um, I work with these two young, amazing writers that are also over there, Abigail and Rachel. And we created um, a radio play that is um, a full length thing. So just think about, instead of a podcast that's episodic, you turn it on, you listen, you can talk to your friends, you can be with your family. It's affordable for all, it's affordable. It's for all ages and it's about a spirit named Andres who's in this small town. I think everyone can kind of relate to a small town, whether you're from the city, just that point of view or any of those things. And he, there's these uh, vengeful spirits that get released in this small town. And it's a group of, think of like your Scooby-Doo gang, you know, very uh, people of different backgrounds and different uh, social archetypes that have to come together and solve what is going on and to save the town. So you're going to have a lot of fun. There's going to there's there's laughter, there's danger, there's mystery, there's all those different things that you know we you have to as a listener also you can solve the mystery along with them. It's called Hollow's Bend the Radio Play, and it will be dropping on all platforms: Spotify, Apple, Tidal, everything, Deezer, uh, in September. So there is a QR code. You can come find me after, and you can scan it. <laughs> but it's gonna be it's gonna be great. And audio is such an important storytelling mechanism that I think just as we continue moving with content, it's gonna continue to grow. It's gonna continue to grow. And it also, what I love about the audio world is you don't need permission to, to create something. You don't need permission. If you have an idea, whether it's you know, an interview show or you know, maybe you wanna tell a story, you have a family story that you wanna tell, you can do it and you can put it up and you can share your story with the world. And that's a powerful tool that audio provides. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if, you know, what economic status you have. You can share your story in the audio space. You said September, correct? September. And we can come find you for that QR code? Yes, you can. Okay, because I'm going to be doing that after this. Uh, yes, you are, Chris. <laughs> uh, moving down, is there anything else that anybody wants to talk about in regards to telling stories outside of the realm of what you have particularly done or outside the realm of books, film, or TV? Yeah, I am. Um, oh, you want to raise hands? Do it. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so Mike is like, yours. Let's just jump in and like, <laughs> um, you know, I think something that's really interesting is the democracy the democratization of storytelling. So things like audio as a, as a place where you, where you don't have to have permission to tell stories, I think is very interesting. Um, but something else that I think is really interesting is, is actually inspiring creativity in an audience that's consuming your content and then giving them kind of a playground to play in um, to tell their own versions of the story. So it's kind of like fan fiction, except they get their own you know, characters and they get to use elements of the world to build the world even further beyond even what the creator could do. So that's something that, um, that's something that we're exploring over at Lost Children of Andromeda, which is the ability to, commercial, to allow um, people who hold the digital assets to have commercial rights over those assets and create on their own. And we, as a, as a platform, as a brand, um, giving people resources to bring their stories to life in whatever format they feel is most uh, agreeable to them. Um, and helping them with, you know, the whole process of the mental, the, the again, like figuring out like what artists to use and how to write scripts and um, all of that. 
uh, to help further their own creativity, you know, building out this world, and then eventually maybe they create a world of their own. Um, so yeah, it's like a, a path to permissionless creativity um, through com through community uh, building. Wow, yeah. that was a great answer. Yes, you know, I, I think that uh, from the composing standpoint, it wasn't that long. Uh, time is relative, but let's say <laughs> <laughs> let's say you know maybe like. 15 years ago, I think there was more of, of a, um, a perception that a composer might be like, here's a film composer, here's a TV composer, here's a game composer. And I feel as though um, over the years, with, with thanks to some high profile composers who have really branched through the different mediums so successfully, I think that nowadays, because you're asking about you know, yeah. different mediums, mm -hmm. that it's the perfect time, you know, to be writing for different types of projects. Um, I, I, don't, I don't usually talk about one aspect of, of my history, but one of my biggest inspirations for getting into this industry is uh, my uncle, who's a film composer, Howard Shore. And um, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Huge influence for me. Um, you know, we went to the same college, 30 years apart. We play the same instruments. He recommended going to Berklee College of Music, which is where I went. Um, and I worked for Howard for four years when I first graduated from college. And so a huge influence for me. And Howard was primarily scoring movies. And so that's what I wanted to do. You know, I was like, that looks great, you know, really exciting. So, um, but then it was maybe about 10 years ago that I started noticing that my contemporaries were not just doing one type of medium. Mm. And so I started branching out, making a, a a purposeful, you know, uh, effort, you know, to say, you know, I can do more than film. And so now I, I regularly score television and now virtual reality and games and live events and advertising. So I just think that it's a, such a, an amazing time right now that we're all living in that storytelling is storytelling. And it, and I mean, we're seeing it now, you know, between film and TV, where almost TV is taking over as, as like the dominant medium for, incredible storytelling. So um, I just think it's a really special time and, and, and it's a great time for all of us you know, to be doing different types of things. Mm, mm. I, did, I just wanted to add yeah. uh, that you know, like during, during the height or peak of, of COVID, I, had, uh, I try and <clears throat> hold myself to doing three to four passion projects a year. Um, so each year I can come out with either a new script, a new, you know, short film, web series, whatever, even while doing TV, because that was how I got into a position to get hired to do it. And, um, you know, I think for the creators who are in this room, uh, there's a value in being platform agnostic and not having, you know, the, like, like, like Ryan saying, like, the, oh, I don't do this or I won't do that. And so I had a short film that I was looking to do that I was like, well, I'm not absorbing the COVID cost. So um, I turned it into a, a narrative podcast. And it was great because it, it was so freeing to do it. And I was able to get friends and, and really talented actors because it was like, um, you know, my wife is an actor. Uh, hey, I need you for three hours. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, Coleman Domingo, boom, two hours. You know, like all these people just came through and we made this podcast that was kind of a conversation around the 2020 election. And it was so freeing and so much easier to accomplish while building a creative muscle that often gets overlooked for directors, which is how much you can enhance what you do when you get to the sound mix or to the you know oral design of what you're trying to accomplish and so you know for anybody out there i just say you know make something you can you can express your voice in via an iphone or an alexa or a, a voice memo app it's all the same you don't need permission just be creative mm. that's pretty much what it is <laughs> anybody else have anything else they want to add before we move on Okay, good, because I really like this question. This is one of my favorite <laughs> questions. So uh, this question is for everybody. We'll start on that end this time and kind of work this way. Thank you. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> Working very hard at this end of over here. Are there any fun Easter eggs you've snuck into your work? Now, I feel like this is a complicated question, so this is me sparing time a little bit for letting them think about their answers. Huh? huh? Do you have any Easter eggs? I, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. We should go into har do harmonies. We can do harmonies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've put some Easter eggs into some scores. Um, they're, they're true Easter eggs, like you'd have to search for them. Um, but I remember one time I was, I was scoring a movie. Um, it, was, it was a film some years ago called Confession. Um, it starred Chris Pine. And um, there was uh, some Gregorian chant that I wrote for it. And so I, I needed to come up with lyrics. And I presumed that most people wouldn't know what Gregorian chant lyrics sound like. <laughs> so I put the director's name. In, <laughs> there you go. And, and I didn't say anything. I just put it in the sheet music. Did the director know? Uh, I told him. OK, OK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we were sort of like giggling, you know, like on the side, like as the musicians were, were recording. And uh, little did I know that one of, the, one of the singers was so experienced and actually knew Gregorian chant music. No. Oh. And, and, he's, and he literally said like, hey, what's the syllable? I don't, I don't recognize that. <laughs> And I was literally like, uh, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and sing that. Yeah, you don't, how yeah. about you just sing it's it? It's cool. <laughs> yeah. But it was an Easter egg. I love that. Yeah. James, this is kind of your entire job, right? Yeah, although, um, you know, hidden Easter eggs, uh, I don't get the opportunity very much, but I would say that uh, any chance I get, any chance, I will put my son in a song. How, whenever I can, I just get him in the studio. I'm like, buddy, come here. I need a, I need a little hey or a little thing. <laughs> and uh, and he thinks he's like Paul McCartney or whatever. He, he even holds the headphones like this, like he yes. thinks he's just like a superstar. Yes. Uh, but uh, so one of the shows that we also do is called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, and it's the sequel to Mr. Rogers. Uh, so uh, you know, oftentimes there's uh, child characters or background characters, uh, and. Also, if I need, sometimes we run into a situation where we need singers that aren't particularly great. Actually, the theme song to <laughs> Total Drama, at the end, there's a group of campers all singing, na, 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 na. So I call my wife for those situations. <laughs> uh, and it's perfect because she just sounds totally out of tune and it works. Is your so wife here? No. Okay, That's good. That's why okay, I good. Okay, tell good. this story. Uh, hopefully, she's now watching later, too. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so any chance I can get my family in there, because also years from now, when my son's grown up and I can just, uh, you know, uh, point to like, hey, let's watch uh, that, that Daniel Tiger episode where you did the thing, you were so cute, and he'll get embarrassed. Yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love this question. It's so a good question. I, I have a few very interesting Easter eggs in, in kind of in the story and in the digital asset. So one element is that if you read or when you read 2050Z, Time and Salvation, you will, the Easter egg is kind of my childhood. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a play on my relationship with my mother mm -hmm. and her power, um, my relationship with myself and my power, and then my relationship with my father. It plays a little bit with like the distance with which we grew up, but how inspirational he was always to me. And then my complicated re relationship with my mother that blossomed into this beautiful experience of us kind of growing together. So that's like a very, intimate Easter egg. Yeah. Um, some more like pop culture Easter eggs. I really love the movie Devil Wears Prada. Yes. There's, so there's actually a line. <laughs> there's a line in the novel that pays homage to Miranda Priestly. Um, through a character that's very similar to her in terms of poise and, and, and like power. Uh, so that's really fun. And then in the digital assets, you know, we release these kind of futuristic watches that have all these different attributes, like different platform colors. And so in those descriptions, you know, if you look on kind of OpenSea, you'll see uh, names of the civilizations from future uh, civilizations that will come in the story later, colors, um, powers, um, some other nerd things that I really like, like like um, homages to like X Men and Marvel. Um, so yeah, it's very if you if you know you know like there there's this one watch. And um, the band has a particular design, and the name of the design is called Nathan. And so, <laughs> like, if you can, if you know, you know. But if you don't, you won't. So, yeah. So I, we're just I to so we're just to assume is that a reference? It's going to be a reference. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Got yeah, it. Got it. Got yeah, it. Got yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> Wendy, how about yourself? Do you have any Easter eggs that you've hidden in your work? Well, I think when you're a parent, you're always putting. He's been in so many <laughs> backgrounds. You know, I need a photo of a kid. It was like, my kid. So, <laughs> but I think the weirdest one was when I first, we're it's so personal, I hope it's okay. Um, when I first met my husband's mother, we were 
in her home helping her move. And it was the first time I was in her home. And I looked up at the fireplace and there was nothing in the, above the fireplace, but just to the left was the head of a gazelle. <laughs> and it, I looked at it and I was just like, you know, just thought about it for a couple of days. And finally I asked her, I was like, why? You know, you'd think it'd be over the fireplace. And she was like, well, I don't really like it. So I thought nobody would notice it if I put it over there. <laughs> And it was like, made it way more noticeable. Well, they were packing up the house and the gazelle head went into the box and I just didn't, you know, like, you can't throw away a gazelle head. So I took it. <laughs> and it was in my garage for a really, really long time. And then I did a show called Monk. And, you know, that character- I love that show I did so too. much. And I had this like brilliant idea, which is like, if Monk had gone into my mother-in-law's house, that character, that would have driven him freaking insane, right? <laughs> so I did it. I took her gazelle, and in this house that he had to do, you know, spend a lot of time for this sure. case, I put the gazelle head off to the side, and he kept noticing it. And so it was an Easter egg for my, then she became my mother-in-law. So that was probably the That's most, awesome. you know, kind of, uh, you know, the biggest Easter egg that I left. But I always like to like put books or if I have friends that are artists or photographers, mm. I'll dress a set with their work. Oh, fun. Um, first season, Grey's Anatomy, you know, photographs of friends in apartments and stuff like that. So I, I always try to, and even if I, you know, I don't know, if I like just an art, I see an artist and I'm like, who sure. are you? Like, that's cool. Let's, you know, let's I love see what that. we can do. So cool. yeah, it's a great opportunity to, you know, give people exposure, mm. you know, not just the gazelle, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, give people exposure that sure. you can't buy. So it's cool. Sure. Yeah. I love that. Pete, how about I, you? I, I cannot top that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, mine is much more self-serving. Uh, but I, I wrote a book. And so sometimes on the, on the last show that I did, this show called Reasonable Doubt, um, that'll come out on Hulu the books on the main character's bookshelf as it should be honestly as it should be you have every right to put that there <laughs> i don't think she read it <laughs> but she will <laughs> uh let's see i was thinking about that because i i love easter egg stuff mm. i do that on so many of my projects whether people notice it or not uh for behind the music uh there's an easter egg of um we, of course, as we're talking, you know, Duran Duran's telling their story and talking about, you know, the songwriting process and everything. I had the idea, as they were talking about constructing the music, I was like, you know what it would be really cool if I just take the stems and put it behind them, and so as they're talking about it, that you actually build the song as they talk about it. Ooh. So I put that Easter egg in there. Um, in every different episode, there's a ran not a random, there's a strategic Easter egg <laughs> that I just put in in the edit. Mm -hmm. Also, um, when we interview the artists and you get to know them and, and research their story, I always find hidden Easter eggs that they say and I'll incorporate it from a sonic tone. Mm. So if it doesn't make the actual episode of what they said, I'll incorporate that, and whether it's through a sonic sound, a song, all those different things. Uh, for Fat Joe, our Fat Joe episode, you know, he's talking about growing up in the Bronx, and so of course, I just deep dived into all the different artists that he grew up in to find the perfect song with him. And when he watched it, he said, you get me, Jen. You get where yeah. I came from, you get, my, you get who I am. So it's always nice when the artists they notice those things, but the stems thing, every, my showrunner was like, can we do that? Are we gonna get permission for it? And I was like, I got you, don't worry about it. And <laughs> he was like, how did you pull that off? And I was like, I know people. <laughs> <laughs> but I always put little Easter eggs, uh, whether it's from a sonic storytelling point of view or my personal taste um, in some of the episodes. So last night, actually yesterday, Paramount Plus just dropped 10 more episodes of Behind the Music on Paramount hey. Plus. Oh my gosh which is exciting, so please check them out. And then we have more coming in this fall, including some amazing stories. And just finding those different sonic Easter eggs through storytelling is always my favorite part. Or if it's on a feature film, um, Deadly Illusions I did on Netflix, I did an Easter egg that was with haunting children's lullabies. That w it was my idea to weave into the score, and my composer's like, I love that. And everyone's like, what's with the weird haunting lullabies? And it just, it became a thing. And so for this director, now we have this shorthand with those types of things. 
Uh, it's just kind of fun to find the storytelling sonic Easter egg mechanisms for Deadly Illusions, spoiler alert, the lullaby is kind of foreshadowing what you find out about our main character at the end mm -hmm. that goes back to her childhood. So it's like a deep layer mm -hmm. thing. And the director's like, oh my gosh, that's haunting. I love it. <laughs> a deep cut, if you it will. It was a deep cut. <laughs> okay, so this next question is kind of going to be a little bit of an open forum, like uh, one of the previous questions. But we're going to start with Jason. Uh, what trends are you seeing in the industry right now, and how do you think they will play out over the next 10 years? Are we going to be here in 10 years? <laughs> good question. <laughs> Very good question. I don't know. Uh, I can, I'll can. i speak to kind of literature and Web3 because I'm not super in, in entertainment. I'm kind of on the fringes. Um, so I think in literature, uh, one trend that I'm seeing is the ability to create without permission. It's becoming a lot more popular that independent authors can uh, find audiences, especially online, build communities and deploy content through them without necessarily needing um, a massive support from other channels. I think graphic novels and comic books speak to that more uh, powerfully than probably novels, but uh, that's what I've seen. Uh, the the trend in audio, I think, is really interesting, especially for um, books and novels in particular, because uh, it has surpassed in terms of sales volume um, ebooks. Uh, and then, I think for Web three is being able to uh, show authentic and real ownership through these kind of timestamps on the blockchain that show, you know. I really own the first edition of this comic book or this figurine, and that kind of matches up with whatever you have in the physical world. Mm. Um, and I think in 10 years, everyone will be looking to these, will be looking to digital verification for most things, whether it be identity, um, content ownership, uh, royalty, distributions, like all of that stuff is all able to be um, powered and checked and held accountable through the blockchain, so. Tis yeah. the future we are living in. Does anybody else have anything? Yeah, please. I was gonna say that um, really early on, the first season of Arrow, you know, they had eight episodes. I don't remember how many, but I was, I was sitting at this table and it was all white men and me. And I was very excited to be at that table, but it was also kind of intense, you know, and felt like I was representing, uh, you know, people that weren't necessarily going to be, had been, had that opportunity. And what I'm happy to notice is that people like Greg Berlanti and the Marvel folks and the DGA and different networks and studios are really putting more and more effort into hiring diverse uh, directors and training diverse directors. And that to me has been, I mean, we've got a long way to go for sure, but it's started and it's everyone is thinking about it and there are way more stories to be told than, you know, and people should be telling them. And so I have to say in the 16 years, 17 years I've been doing this, I have really, I'm happy that it, the, you know, the playing ground is changing and that the faces are changing and the stories are expanding and that I hope continues and picks up speed. And, you know, we live in a really fabulously diverse country and there are a lot of people that should be telling their stories. And I feel like, you know, ideas like, you know, tell, doing your web series, taking photographs. You know, I took a photo class during COVID just because I wanted to express myself. You know, there are just ways to represent yourself or people that you love and communities that you come from. and your, you know, your ancestors or your children. Um, and I do think that the industry is, you know, making significant, although it should be more, but significant movement. And I have noticed a change since I started and I'm really happy about that. Mm. That's very encouraging to hear. I love that. I mean, there's a lot, it's the beginning. Sure, like, Don't sure, get sure. me wrong. <laughs> we're in the right direction but, though, at least we're going. <laughs> it's in the right direction. You know, Greg Berlanti has, you know, he'll, take somebody like Andy Armidian, who uh, was an editor and had edited a bunch of his stuff and gave her the opportunity to direct and then made her a showrunner. Wow. You know, so there are people that are invested in that and more people should be mm. uh, because there's tons of talent 
and you know that people you know should get opportunities and prove to prove themselves sure sure wow does anybody else have anything yeah so um I'm based in Seattle. I've been uh, living there and working there for about 15 years. Uh, and I can only speak from uh, my experience in the animation world. Uh, but for, for the last, uh, like pre-COVID, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to not meet anybody involved with the show other than my business partners. Like they would just send me like the, the episode and here's what you need to do. Uh, and I felt a little bit sort of cut off, uh, understandably, which is also awesome because uh, us composers, I, I can maybe speak for you as well, but uh, I think we like to be left alone to sort of do our thing and be in the studio till three in the morning and like <laughs> not have to deal with people. So it's kind of a blessing, but it also is uh, kind of a double-edged sword because I would feel sort of cut off or I wouldn't know faces to names and stuff. And since COVID, it has been Zoom calls and Microsoft Teams and all of this <laughs> stuff, okay? So many um, Zoom calls. And so I, many. I have to say, I, I, find, I have found it amazing because I feel like part of a team on every single show mm. now. And I know people's names and I know their faces and they laugh at my jokes. There's like, <laughs> a, there's like a human connection for the first time in 15 years, right? Uh, and it took COVID to make that happen. And also noticing, I'd say 50% of the people on the Zoom calls are at their home, like just working at home. Mm. The animators are working at home, the producers, the directors, not all the time, but quite often. The ability to share documents right on our screen and talk, talk through things, like it's a whole new world for me and I don't see it going back. I only see it just sort of doubling down into this. Uh, I think this is just gonna be the way that it is from now on, which is awesome. So that's- We like this trend. We like this trend, I think collectively. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I agree. And, and you know, to continue on that thought, and I've noticed the same thing, you know, like I get to actually see the people I'm working with and interact, which is awesome. Um, and I also find that in, with all this technology that's available today, I feel as though everyone in general is more accessible. You know, I feel like when I started out in the industry and I was interested in, in composing for film, I didn't even know what most of the composers looked like. You know, like I, I knew one photo, you know, that, that would get circulated, like their one press shot, and I just thought they looked like that all day long. You know, <laughs> that's just what they look like. So, but now I find, you know, with social media, it, it's, it's so much easier just to reach out to artists and connect with people in a way that hasn't ever been really possible before until, you know, the, this era that we're in. And I, I, I foresee that continuing um, to happen as we go forward. It's just easier and easier to connect with people. Okay. Uh, to kind of jump on that, I've noticed, and I think it's going to continue, as, especially as a music supervisor, people always think of music as an afterthought. Music is the least most important thing in any project, <laughs> um, which it's funny, but that's just kind of how it is. But since you know, COVID has happened and the Zooms, they're treating us more as the team where there's, there used to be such a division of above the line, directors, actors, DP, and below the line, post-production, music supervisors, composers. And now there's not so much of a division. That division is starting to go away. And filmmaking, you know, whether it's audio, literature, whatever, it's such a collaborative process. And so that blend of, you're below the line, I don't need to talk to you, or just, just the whole uh, attitude some people had about the different departments, it's starting to change. And I'm noticing that it's more of a team effort, which any sort of content making is a team effort. There's no, you know, this person's more important. It's such a collaborative process between working with your director, your post-production supervisor, your editor, the writer, the producer, the DP, the head of, you know, costume design, Every single department and within those departments are so important to the collaborative process. So it's really nice that now it's not so, you're here, you're here, don't cross the line. It's 100% a team effort. And I don't think that's gonna go away. I think it's just gonna get more seamless as the years go, which is fantastic. And it also opens opportunities for other people in different departments and to create actually authentic relationships within your team. And it's just so beautiful, and I don't think that's gonna change, it's just gonna get stronger. All positive trends. I was expecting to get something like apocalyptic, but that was great, I love that. I'd love to, I'd love to touch on diversity a little bit more too, because I think it's really important for someone like, for someone like myself who has been writing since I was very young, 
and not necessarily seeing people that look like me writing in the genre of science fiction slash fantasy, not in any level, not in the prominence of, you know, of others. Um, I think that's one trend that's really cool is that because more of us are stepping out, um, being bold, um, taking liberty, telling stories, we're encouraging more people to do that. And so I think that part of it will be what you spoke to, which is the industry actually opening doors for people, mm -hmm. and then the courage of individuals actually stepping forward, and then um, communities deciding what gets seen and what gets amplified. Mm -hmm. So it, it starts to create this effect where, yes, in 10 years, we're looking at a much more uh, representative uh, landscape for stories from you know, the diverse world, country, um, yeah. I also think some of, you know, there are some programs, if, for all of you that are interested, you know, most of the networks and studios have diversity programs so that, you know, you can apply. You generally have to have a little bit of work, like a short film or something. It doesn't have to be polished network type. But, and the other thing is that I know from the Women's Committee of the DGA, and I think most of the committees are doing things where we're trying to, you know, have um, mentors. So we're, we're trying to be mentors, sorry, and, you know, mentor young people. Um, and I think those things, you know, they're such an old world idea of a mm -hmm. mentor, and I love it. You know, I think it's such an important thing that, and it's also the best way to learn. I mean, I think film school is really cool, and you can meet people, and, you know, you have an opportunity. If you can afford it, it's great. But if you can't, you know, you get the job, or you try to get become a PA something, and you, you know, you make these relationships, and you, that's mentoring. You know, you're slowly moving your way in and around a set, and working your way up. And I, I just, you know, the one thing that I would say is to, you know, find good people. And if they're not, if they're disrespectful or taking advantage or you know anything, move on. Find somebody else because it shouldn't ever have to be that way to get, you know, to make it, you know, to make your way. But um. But yeah, just, you know, there are lots of mentoring programs and things that will create a situation where we'll have more stories, mm -hmm. stories that, you know, haven't been told that should be. This is now the incredible life coach panel, you guys. Because, <laughs> like, such good advice, genuinely, genuinely such good advice. Yes, please. All right, so I think that is all the time that we have for today, unfortunately. Um, but I'm very inspired, and I'm sure everyone in the audience is too. Um, let's see, let's see. I want to thank you guys all so much. The panelists here, Jennifer, Pete, Wendy, Jason, James, and Ryan. Give them a round of applause. Thank you guys so much for being here and sharing all your incredible knowledge. Also, thank you to Impact 24 PR and Comic-Con for putting this panel together. Woo!